What's up, Grinder School? This is Carithers, and welcome to a new series. Um, this is a how to master series for the modern times. We've done one on full ring, six max, singles, MTTs, you name it, but we've never done one, I believe, on Zoom, which is a game that we're all sort of playing these days while trying to make our mark at the Zoom tables. So I'm here with my friend and student Scott today. Um, what's going on, man? You alright? Yeah, good. Good. And we're going to be working together on, we've been working on your Zoom game already. Um, but we're going to be doing that in the spotlight of the audience of the Grinder School members now and kind of talking a bit about how we should approach Zoom, how it's different from regular tables. Um, we will be getting into some theory later on in this series, but for now we're just going to be doing a sort of gentle intro. So I just want to, let's get to know you, let's talk a little bit about why there's a big blue and white cross in the middle of the screen. That can be the first question. Why is there a big blue and white cross in the middle of the it's, screen? Well, it's definitely got nothing to do with our accent anyway. Um, <laughs> definitely not. Yeah, it should be pretty obvious, I suppose. Yeah, maybe yours is stronger than mine because I've got the whole internationalised, I make stuff on the internet so I can't speak like a Glaswegian as someone from <laughs> Glasgow, biggest city in Scotland. Because it wouldn't be com comprehensible, basically. But yeah, we're both from Scotland and, you know, Kind of coincidental, right? Because poker world yeah. is like global. And just to find a student, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of students over the years, and I've only ever had one or two that are from Scotland, um, including you. So I think well, you're it's like even more strange. It's even more strange the fact that I started listening to your podcast when I was living in Australia. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah totally. Just, sure. just brings you brings you back, like gives you a bit of sort of nostalgia, homesickness when you hear the the twang, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So. <laughs> How did you um, first get into sort of playing <clears throat> online poker and why have you decided that Zoom is the game for you? Um, well, I started playing poker about two or three years ago when I was living in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and I just instantly became really fascinated by it all. Um, and I loved the game and just thought I would, I would take it up. Cool. And what about Zoom over, like, did you try other formats? Did you try, like, tournaments, I've, singles? Yeah, I actually, I actually started out just playing, like, sort of singles and MTTs. Yeah. And I had some initial success with them, probably too early of a success, because it sort of blinded me a little bit, mm -hmm. um, which is maybe something we can talk about later on. Um, but, yeah, sort of transition to cash... Uh, sort of this year, mm -hmm. and um, decided to to take up Zoom. Cool. So we can talk about that now, actually. So did you get off to like a heater? Was it like beginner's fish luck when you first began poker? Yeah. So I banked and like I came in. Well, I won. I came second in like two big MTTs. Mm -hmm. I think it was like the hot. It was like you know you get those hot and the bigger ones. So it was like the hot. To twenty and the hot three thirty oh, came nice, like yeah. second in both of those, and they've got huge fields of like thousands upon thousands of yeah, as well, exactly, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. So like within the first, within the first like two or three or four months of me playing, I'd won like two thousand dollars or something like that. Nice, cool. um, and um, yeah, just kind of. <laughs> I'm not saying that I lost it all; I, I cashed out a bit and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's sort of blinded me a little bit. Yeah, and it's not common right. either. I'm sure there's people out here watching this video that are like, God damn it, you know, I've been playing poker for five months and I've only managed to build like three hundred and fifty dollars in my role instead of yeah. playing like five and L and it's like a long process. So how did that did that set you up with a degree of like unjustified confidence in your own game, do you think? I think it did, yeah, to a to, to a degree anyway. Mm -hmm. Um but as time went on, I, I wanted to put more time into learning the game and studying the game. So I, I suppose in a way, it did blind me, but in another way, it sort of pushed me yeah. to try and become better as well it's at the same like, time. Yeah, here's a taste of the sweet life. Like, this is what it could be like if you can do this consistently, regularly. Yeah. yeah that's cool. Uh -huh. I remember when I first started playing poker, I thought I was like a god. And I remember sitting with like a couple of friends once I played home games with, and I was a little bit drunk and like overconfident. I just remember like going on this rant where I was like, I am the best poker player in the world. Like I'm literally the best in the world. And they yeah. were like, no, you're not. Like you're just the guy that donks around and like micro stakes <laughs> online and then takes like fivers off people, five pound notes <laughs> off people that aren't very good at poker. And I was like, no, no, I'm seriously like, the best poker player in the world. I thought it was like Phil Helmuth or something. I Phil Helmuth yeah. was actually as good as he thinks he is. Um, and then it's called, I guess it's called the newbie circle of death because you have a bit of success and then 
you know, you end up like hitting a downswing, you, the harsh reality of the world hits you. It's like, yeah. you know, when you move out home for the first time and you realize how tough things can actually be when you're not being looked after. It's like that in poker too. When variance kicks you in sure. the balls for the first time, you're kind of like, oh, wow, um, when will this end? So what were your experiences after that? Did you sort of hit a, a reality downswing or anything? Um, yeah, well, not anything that was too dramatic. Um, but I just, as I said, I just, I just had that, um, had the bug, you know, I just wanted to improve my game and, and try and get better. For sure. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's brought me to, to where I am just now. Cool. And what steps have you taken then? Obviously, you've joined grinderschool.com, I'd imagine. Um, yes. <laughs> I probably asked you that before and then simply forgotten in my old age memory. Um, and then what did you do after that to sort of... Besides watching videos and things, what did you do to work on your game actively? Um, well, I started buying books and things like that. And I know that people, you know, like these days, people say that books aren't really, you know, you're better off just playing and watching videos and stuff like that. But yeah. I still think that there's a merit to actually reading books because at the end of the day, everyone learns differently. Yep. Um, so what works for one person might not work for someone else, and I, I, I do get a benefit of, of reading things, and I think it's really important. I think everyone should do it. It depends, I guess, on... Um, I think everyone should do some of their own independent reading, but I think it's... Um, there are obviously like a few different types of learners. There's um, yeah. audio, visual, kinesthetic. depends on how you best learn. So if you're like a visual learner, and you learn well by like watching videos, slides, reading books, then definitely you want to... You want to do that if it's just you in your own bubble and that's how you get the most information ingrained, then for sure. Um, yeah. So how did you find, when we first started doing coaching, what were the biggest things that jumped out at you of what you might have been doing wrong or what have we been fixing? Um, well, we fixed, the, the, the biggest thing for me was the red line issues, I think. Huh. Um, so, you know, we fixed things like um, not see betting enough, uh, doubling and tripling more, things like that. Yeah. And it's still very um, much early days as well. I mean, we've been working together for, you know, maybe closer to two months and one month yeah. now, but certainly not a long time or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I'm still, to, still trying to iron things out, see the yeah. implications of that and volume and things like that. But, yeah, the red line is, like, honestly, most people who play Zoom or even regular tables who come to me for coaching these days <laughs> have a terrible red line. They're just not defending their blinds enough. They're just not winning enough small mm -hmm. pots. They're not aggressive enough. The ranges are unbalanced towards value in too many situations. And there's yeah. all these things, you know, one win soft flops, that's too low. We saw all of these issues in the series um, that I did with Elliot, Poker Resus. You can look that up, guys, on grindedskill.com, Poker Resus, um, if you want just a huge sort of um, guinea pig study of a student that had red line issues who we fixed and turned into a successful player who made a lot of progress. That's one to watch. So we hope to emulate the success of poker recess in the Zoom sphere. So how is Zoom then going to be different from regular tables? What differences are we going to... What do you think the big ones are? There's a lot, obviously. Yeah, there's, there's, um, there's quite a lot. Um, I mean, the first difference is that you're never going to have... You're never going to have the same win rate at Zoom as what you are at the regular tables. Yeah, and why is that? Um, um, well... Well, we just need to play the, the volume. It's all about volume in Zoom. Yep, so um, you have a lower yeah. win rate, so you've got to play more hands per hour. But what do you think makes it the case that people just struggle to get like a really high win rate in Zoom? Probably, probably because they're not playing as much hands. Like they won't have as many stats on people yeah. as what they normally would. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say is the main reason. Definitely. I will be putting you on the spot all the time in this series, by the way, so get used to the panicky <laughs> feeling of, oh, no, I have to answer a tough question in front of, like, lots of people I don't know. Um, that's just the way it goes, I'm afraid. That will be good for your poker composure. Um, so, yeah, definitely the, the lack of info thing is big. You know, you just don't get into as many exploitative spots as you do in regular. Um, that's the main one, really. Yeah. Um, just not having that edge. Also, dynamic. Like when you have a fish at your table at regular, and you do one thing mm -hmm. against them that makes that player angry, your edge sometimes just catapults into like the astronomic spheres of win rate against that one guy. So when you ISO him in future, he's gonna make so many mistakes because he's already seen you like be aggressive to against them or something. And that's huge, you know. In Zoom, it's more like just everyone's going around with a mask on. No one's got yeah. personal vendettas, really, in these big player pools. And so you get less of this tiltedness 
yep. less of this chance to exploit people mentally and use the sort of psychology of poker. You, there's less of he thinks, I think, in Zoom and more of the population does X, so I'm going to do Y. So our, our, ex, our exploitation in Zoom is not so much about, well, I think now that he's adjusting to me by doing this. It's more actually about, well, the population just tends to play in this way. Yep. And so what we'll do is we'll go through some of your population reads today. And I want to make the point that while we will talk about Heroes range a lot, and we will in this series try and define you know, what hero strategy should be like to be balanced or to exploit a population. We're more often going to be doing the latter. We're going to be tailoring our hero strategy to exploit the population rather than just saying, okay, I know nothing about villain at all. So that's just not true unless you don't have a population read for a certain spot, you know. So if you don't know the player type, it doesn't mean that you know nothing. If you only got four hands in the guy and he's limped, he's a fish, you know loads about him. So we're going to be okay. using all these little clues, you know, to just build up player profiles and build up exploitative strategies, counter adjustments, like right off the bat, even when it seems like we have very limited info. First of all, I'm going to ask you a few questions just to get off on a lighter note about mm -hmm. Scotland for anyone that's wondering, because I'll start this with a story. I, I was in Vegas a few years ago, and most people over there were very like friendly and just very knowledgeable and were intrigued to know more about Scotland. A lot of them have ancestors, you know. I'm sure you've been to like Australia, you know how it is there in yeah. America where people are like, oh yeah, um, do you know Jimmy from like this little <laughs> village in Scotland as if there's only like nine of us that live there. So you get that. Um, and then, but most people are really like, they like the Scottish people because we have like, you know, I don't know, we're known to like drink a lot of whiskey and not really give a shit. And we're not really... I guess, tarred with the same brush as the rest of the UK. I think there's something like if you're Scottish or Irish or something, it tends to be received pretty well. Um, but yeah. I was in Vegas once and I was like amazed, right? Because I was playing poker at this table and, you know, they, they noticed my accent and one guy's like, oh, where are you from, buddy? And I'm like, Scotland. And he says, wow, really? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I'd never known. I was like, why? And he's like, well, your English is, can I just say your English is fantastic. It's almost like it's your first language. So, question one, Scott, what's the, the native language of the Scottish people these days? Scottish, obviously. Scottish, yeah, <laughs> which is English with an accent, basically, yes. and a few, a few words. Instead of saying little for small things, we call them we, W-E-E, yes. -E -E, for example. But, you know, we're, we, we do speak English, so do expect if you meet someone from Scotland that their English will be pretty good, if not slightly, you know, incomprehensible due to the accent. Um, what about haggis? Are those, like, animals? Um, do you know something? I've, I've, um, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're not gonna believe me. I've never actually had haggis in my really? life. Really? Wow. Honestly, <laughs> I've never, I've never tried it in my life. So it's like, what is haggis though? Um, it's like, um, it's just like a bunch of stuff put together. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> bunch of stuff you wouldn't normally eat of animals, like organs of animals yeah. mixed with, um oats mixed with spices, basically. It's really delicious. You should try it if you like things like that. I don't know what it's like haggis, but if you like disgusting, meaty things, then, you know, you should definitely try haggis. Um, what about those skirts that we wear? You ever worn one of those? I've worn a kilt, yeah. yeah. Only, but we only, really, we only really do that at weddings. People think that, like, you know, we walk about the streets with them. That's <laughs> yeah. not the case, everyone. Yeah, I've only worn one once, and I was like, one of my best friends got married, and I was his best man, so I had to wear a kilt and stuff, but yeah, it's the only time. I actually thought it was really smart, I do think kilts look, you know, look pretty, look pretty snappy, but um, yeah, we don't wear them every day, because they're really, really uncomfortable, and warm, and yeah. woolly, and itchy, and they irritate you, so yeah, yeah, yeah we don't sure. really do that so much, not our normal attire, we kind of just dress like normal people, I suppose. Yeah. One thing I hate about Scotland is bagpipes. I really I can't stand bagpipes. They're a horrible invention. I actually don't mind. I actually don't mind, especially when, you know, you're walking through the city centre and things like that. Um, yeah. And, you know, you hear them in the background. It just sort of... You, you'll never forget where you are, that's for that's sure. That's true. You will always know that you're in Scotland, but at the same time, I kind of just prefer if someone was just playing a mellow acoustic guitar or something, providing some nicer background music, because they're very whiny. Depends yeah. on the piper, you know? You get some really bad pipers that just sound like they're just murdering cats when they play, and then you get ones that sound okay. Um, yeah. What other Scottish things are there that we can like inform the general world about? Um, well, I, I wish we could talk about Iron Brew, I suppose. Iron Brew is actually... The colours I've used on this scheme are actually just Iron Brew all over. Yeah. Iron Brew is a 
fizzy drink made from metal girders. Um, I don't think it actually is, but that's what people say. Um, and it's like fizzy and orange and it tastes like metal and it's just amazing. It's like the best drink. Yeah. Oh my God, I want can I brew so badly right now. Thanks for giving me this best. craving. Don't have any in the fridge. But yeah, yeah look that up. It's spelled as well. If you want to get Iron Brew, guys, it's spelled like this. Iron Brew. It has no no O in the iron and the brew is B-R-U. So that's Iron Brew. Yeah. It's like my favourite drink. You and Iron Brew fan, are you one of these Scottish people that prefers Coke? No, I love Iron Brew. I've got to have, I've got to have Iron Brew, like, at least once a week. Yeah, for sure, at least, definitely. Good at hangover least. cure as well. If you yeah. end up a bit too drunk, and then the next day, Iron Brew is just caffeine, sugar, just, it's like a it's like a big hug in a can, big fizzy it's hug like, in a can. It's, it's like Iron Brew and a full English breakfast is, like, the best. That's or a full Scottish breakfast, breakfast maybe. Full yeah. Scottish breakfast, yeah. <laughs> Black pudding. Blood sausage, yeah, good stuff. I had that today actually for breakfast. I had a roll with black pudding and square sausage. That's another thing we have in Scotland. Square sausage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Lauren sausage. It's like beef. Anyway, I'm sure everyone wants a bit of poker now, probably. So let's <laughs> yeah. talk about this. Let's talk about your um, your goals as a Zoom grinder. So first of all, your population reads. Um, can you see that? Okay, on my screen. Um. Oh no, because I'm sharing. Yeah, it's okay. I have them here anyway. Okay, you just watch. You can just look at it on yeah, your screen. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So, folding too much when checking flop is pre-flop aggressor. This is a really big one. Like people are always doing this. Mm -hmm. Like at ten and L, they're not balancing their checking range. I've been over this mm -hmm. time and time again. We talked about this in poker resus. How do you exploit this then? Like you've given the read here, so I'm going to put you on the spot and say, what do we do to exploit each one of these against our population? We just need to have like an extremely wide. Stabbing range yeah, when we're checked to. Definitely, like our float flop stat, as it's called in PT4, will just be through the roof. We'll be looking to both both um, make thinner value bets and protection bets than we would normally. <coughs> that might sound kind of weird if they're check folding all the time, but the thing is, if someone's check folding all the time, it just means that you have the best hand so much that you can just afford to protect your equity in spots where you wouldn't if you didn't have the best hand that much. Like, you know, you flop like second pair. And it's a vulnerable second pair, like a pair of eights or something on a lower board, and the small blind checks to you as preflop razor. You should usually just bet there because in yeah. this population specifically, they're not checking enough top pair to punish you for that. And you will just literally protect your equity all the time. And it's just better. Like protection's getting a lot more limelight as it deserves, I think, these days. Back in the day we were always like, Oh, only bet if better hands are folding or worse are calling. And that's not always true. Because betting for protection is more and more important as the population is folding more and as you have the best hand most most often to protect. So yeah, for sure. Never yeah. bluffing the river. What kind of spots do you mean there? Um, do you mean triple just, like after betting flop and turn? Yeah, sorry. I'm, so I'm talking about villains range. Yeah, got you. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So um, and that that goes. I, I think that goes for like everyone in the population, including fish and rights. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, apart from maybe that. the maniac fish or something like that. Yeah, for sure. Yep, so what do we do against that then? What do we do with our um, range? We just look to overfold. Yeah, good. So we would have a more of a discrepancy between the range that we call turn with and the range we call river with. Like it would shrink quite a lot when we get to the river, especially if they have a high turn C bet or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Fish are more likely to call round numbers. This is not one I've ever observed before, but I'll yeah. definitely take your word for it. But this is something I was listening to, um, I think it was the Definite Articles, one of his videos, uh -huh. um, a while ago, and he sort of mentioned it, and I've sort of been playing around with it, and I, you know, I don't I don't have any sort of evidence against it, but it has been working out recently. I can definitely see why it would be true, you know, a fish just is like, oh, it's $10, it just makes sense, it clicks in their head more quickly, they don't have to, like, compute. Like, I imagine, right? This is totally wrong and not fair on these recreational players, but sometimes I imagine that the fish is literally just like a big drooling ogre, like sat somewhere over the internet, just like mashing the keyboard with its like fists. And so like, in my mind, like the fish looks at like the $10, and it's like, ah, $10, I understand, I call. Yeah. But when you make it like 13, 21, the fish is like, whoa, you yeah. know, like crazy, crazy <laughs> accurate number, what's going on? And yeah. then maybe it makes them do something they would normally do because it just rattles them a little bit, you know, and it maybe causes them to fold if they're just a station or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I can see that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's probably more true than the inverse. Like, I'm not sure how true it is, 
But I would definitely say that it must be more true than the statement, fish are more likely to call odd numbers. I don't think that's true at all. I think this is probably true if either is true, so probably yeah. a good way to go. Yeah. Okay. Players are more sticky with their hand heads up. Yeah, I mean, that should be true of any population that's got any kind of sense, I suppose. So, yeah. yeah. I, suppose that, yeah. I suppose we've got that one there. Um, so Because when we're talking about the first point, when they're folding too much, when checked is preflop aggressive, uh -huh. then... We should be more cautious in that instance where we're heads up. Yeah, but probably still not to too much of a degree that it changes yeah. things that much. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. They still are overfolding their range considerably, even heads up, but less so than multi way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. stabbing yeah. multi way is also a good way to improve the red line then as well. We're going to be looking to do a lot of that too, when we, yeah. especially when we have position equity things going for us. No one's through betting light against early from and against early position. Yeah, this is really good because. Like if you just look at three bits that across the board and then try and apply it to every position, you'll go really wrong. You need to actually be aware of the fact that there might be a, a ridiculous, stupid reg that three bits you like twenty percent big blind versus button, but only like four percent, um, like button versus hijack or something like yeah. that. And it's just obviously the adjustment is just to overfold our range when we're in early position and to defend it more when we're in later position and look for more of a balance, meeting our minimum theoretical defense frequency when we're in late position and just discarding that concept altogether in early position and saying, okay, you're not exploiting me here on average, I don't care, I'm overfolding. Yeah. Never, like, defend your range, quote-unquote, optimally, just because you don't know villain. If villain is part of a population that doesn't bluff, that under bluffs, then you need to overfold against under bluffing. That's what you need to do. It doesn't matter whether or not you know that individual is doing it. On average, he will be more often than not, so you do For need sure. to overfold your range. Three betting from blinds tend to be imbalanced. So, do you mean it's got like too many bluffs? Oh, yeah, too many bluffs. Yeah, too uh -huh. many bluffs. Yeah, yeah. Good. So, what do we do against that then? Um, we can do two things. We can open up our four betting range uh -huh. and look to flat more hands in Good. position. For sure, I like it. Players are imbalanced in general. Betting middle pair weak a six, so they don't understand that if they bluff showdown value, they're bluffing too much. Basically, if they bluff yeah. like too much showdown value, so. Mm -hmm. I guess the thing here is that when we've observed that they do have a bluffing range, then we start overcalling considerably because they probably aren't balancing that range well. Yeah. Like it's almost unheard of that someone at these stakes has a triple range on the river that has some bluffs but is mostly value. Yeah. Like that's just not sure. going to be the case. It's going to be either they're bluffing way too much or they're not bluffing enough, basically. I think that if like that's going to change the higher up stakes that you go though as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Definitely. So, People get more balanced as you move up. And so yeah. what you need to do as you move up is make less severe initial adjustments against the population. Like going back to my favorite rock, paper, scissors analogy, um, if you're playing against guys who just always, who are just going to like play loads of scissors for no reason at all, then you know you can just start off playing lots of rock and beat them. But when you're playing against guys who are fairly balanced, you don't want to like stick your neck out and start playing loads of rock because then they can paper you to death. So you need to be careful of to what extent you make an adjustment and how good your reads are when you do it. Okay, so general goals, mark everyone possible. And you want to do this as fast as you can, right? So how are you doing this when you've got very limited info? Um, uh, well, just marking like fish, uh, like, you know, people with not a full stat, yep. um, you know, uh, could be the screen name, uh, could could be like could it. be their uh, picture that they've got. What would you say are like fishy pictures? Um, like I've noticed maybe people with like pictures of babies in, in the picture. You know, <laughs> okay. recently I have honestly. That yeah, is, believe that is, it means it means they're a fish. Honestly. <laughs> I like um, it. but like things like football players, maybe. Yeah, definitely um, a good one. You know, football like players, TV. Yeah. TV series, yep. uh, anything like that. that's like popular culture, like mainstream kind of like yeah. thing, is more likely a fish. And why is that? It's because geeks are regs. So it's nothing against fish. It's not like oh they're so stupid they just like watch what's on TV and then make it their avatar. Although maybe there's an argument for that. But no, I think it's more because I should be careful what I say and just stop insulting like huge demographics <laughs> of people in the world. Like it's horrible. Um, what I mean is like. Regs are geeks, right? And geeks tend to like things that are a little bit less mainstream, like things that are more niche, and they tend to get obsessed with really specific stuff that, you know, non-geeks might not bother obsessing over. 
So when someone has a picture of like League of Legends or something like that, that's probably a wreck, you know? I saw a guy the other day that had a League of Legends champion as his avatar and his screen name. There's just no way in hell this is not a serious yeah. poker player. There's yeah. no chance. Whereas if you see the guy that's got like some really well known actor and then his name has loads of numbers in it and the actor's name, like yeah. probably a fish, to be honest. Yeah. Or if like it's my like avatars, my avatars like the Gears of War. Yeah. Uh, logo. So like um yeah, I can definitely see why uh, you know, like, like things to do with video games, yeah, and definitely. Like definitely things Thanks. like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, I always find that interesting like the whole poker personality, what type of player are they with an avatar, but I guess it's not that central that we should talk about it forever, even though I definitely could. <laughs> um, you can also just use stack size, you can use like player actions, like just micro actions, like if they just limp once, it doesn't matter, like they've mm -hmm. still done one major thing that's told you that they're a fish, or if they make sizing. Sizing is a huge one. Someone min opens under the gun. Okay, people are starting to do this these days. I don't think it's good, but some people are starting to do this, but they're usually yeah. a fish. Or if they like 4x the button, that's definitely a fish these days. Like yeah. no reg in his right mind 4x is the, the button. It's just atrocious. So these kind of things, or when they see bet like three times the pot, or they make a min bet, or they donk out on a really dry board. These are just fishy things and you can tag people as fish based on that as well. And your job as a zoom grinder is actually just to tag fish as quickly as possible as a generic fish color, and then maybe when you know more, you can make it a more accurate fish yeah. color. I want to go over your tags. One in particular cracks me up, and we'll show that to the grinder <laughs> school population. Know your yeah. ranges. I want to talk about that a little bit. Why is that important? Uh, because you need to react as quickly as possible. Good. Yeah. You need so, to save the um, you, you know, you need to know what you're going to do in a given situation within like a second. Yeah, so the common spots, you know, you need to be really quick. You need to not be using valuable thinking power on other tables, just being like, oh, do I 3-bet here? Like, there's no excuse in Zoom for not knowing your generic 3-bet ranges against a reg. It's ridiculous not to. You need to know that. So if you play Zoom and you're always, like, thinking in a vacuum, like, do I 3-bet is 5 suited? Like, you tell me, is it part of your 3-bet range? Have you decided that your preconceived range contains that or not in this position and why? And what have you based on um, relating to your population? So you need to have pre-built ranges. We've done a bunch of this ourselves. We've talked about how to build them on the fly. Sometimes you won't know exactly because they'll be different. Like You'll need to make exploitative adjustments to those. Mm. But then you know what your base range looks like. And then you can be like, well, I'm adding more bluffs to it. Um, so I know what the next bunch of rough hands would be that I would add as bluffs. So you can do that. What's, um, I guess this is like your way of describing autopilot. Click, click, click. Yeah, mode. it is. Yeah, yeah. So... I mean, no, I, I think everyone's guilty of this one at yeah, some point. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, and if you do get like that, then you just need to, you know, take a step back and just sort of maybe even drop a table. Yeah, or take a break. Sometimes it's yeah. good to refresh your attention span. Make sure you're thinking at all times. Like, make sure you're not just, like, robot. Yeah. Okay, cool. So... Today, we're not going to go into too much theory. Next time, we'll probably do a PowerPoint for the first part before we play. There's going to be plenty of live play in this series. I want to see lots of us playing. That's going to be my main focus. We will look at your database at some point and do some um, mm -hmm. stats analysis as well. But for today, my main aim is just to, you know, shoot the shit a little bit, introduce you, go through our aims, and then talk a bit about poker as we play. So why don't we just jump right in and play two tables of Zoom, talk sure. about the population reads as and when they occur, how we're using them, how we're tagging. Um, so go ahead and let's yep, head sure. back and get this show on the road then. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Yeah, I got you. That's a kilt, by the way, right there. <laughs> That's a kilt. That's me in a kilt. We'll bring it back up. So, yeah. It's like the bottle of beer just kind of ruins the, the glassiness <laughs> of the picture in the background. Like a bottle Typical. Of Typical glass region. I know, right? <laughs> Nice chips, by the way. Thank you very much. The the Bellagio chip mod. Uh huh. Everything's yeah. beautiful about the Bellagio. Um, yeah. I wouldn't open that. I think that's too wide because that guy's actually three wing eight point nine percent. Just like um, initial. It was full to steal eighty five, so that's why. Okay, you win. You you win this round, but I will get you with the <laughs> in the future. So yeah, against someone who's folding a lot, you want to obviously decrease your open size and just steal wider yeah. out of the small blind, yeah. Yeah. And that way when he does 3-bet you and you have to fold, he might be exploiting you every time he 3-bet bluffs you, but you're exploiting him more by him folding all the rest of his range, so it's still better for you to do that. That's the thing you need to remember. Like If you can exploit someone better than they can exploit you, then be unbalanced. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, and Bellagio is so, a lovely place to play. I used to play there when I was in Vegas. It was nice. Games are tough, yeah. though. The nicer the environment, the tougher the games because the regs. It's like Stars Online, right? The regs yeah. go there because it's a nice place to play. 3xing because we have... Do we have fish there? Yep. Bag of bones. But I suppose he's like a net fish. Yeah, just just don't don't 3x against him then. Definitely like mid yeah. open against yeah. the net fish. Okay. Um, 5x under the gun. What the hell? Why? Is that reg? And he's like made it... He looks like a reg, doesn't he? But he's made this ridiculous size. Yeah, I'd probably just fold for now, just like respect the 5x if he's going to be an unbalanced player. Yeah. He's jack I should off really, though. Should really make him against them, actually. I know, but that's just so much effort, right? Why would you bother? No, yeah, you're no, right. You're, you're totally right. Go back later. Yeah, you're totally right. You should make notes. Um, I'm just being lazy. Um, yeah, like, you do want to 3-bet his jack off there, I think, sometimes as a bluff. Could be part of your bluffing range against someone who falls a lot to 3-bets, but let's assume that a guy that 5x is under the gun probably doesn't, so let's not have a 3-bet yeah. bluff range there to start. Really weird though. Don't know if there's like an, yeah. another mark on the table who's targeting or something like that because he did look really reggy in his stats. So kind of bizarre. Yes. You don't see it often from no. a person with his stats. No, definitely not. Uh, nine seven is going to be an open here, I think. Yeah, the openness is default in the cutoff for sure. And I would just yeah. go two point five x usually. Yeah. And yeah, get this aggro guy here. Yep, sevens, you can obviously just peel there, you got fish in the big blind, the more fish you have in the big blind, the wider you can peel here, the more squeezes you have ahead, the tighter you need to be on table one. And you really are just playing a fair fault game here, like for the most part, you're not looking to float too many flops, you're not worried about, you know, making it bad for him to stab there, because he's probably just not yeah. stabbing all that light, so you're not really bothered. <clears throat> I might make my C bet size a little bigger on a really wet board just because my range is going to be super strong here and I'm going to be yeah, value okay. betting and betting high equity hands more often than I'm going to be betting as a bluff. And yeah. so I just want more money in the pot. It suits my range to do that. It gives them a worse price with draws, that kind of thing. Yeah. I like your turn sizing here. Yeah. yeah, I think it's fine. It's nice and big. Like three quarters pots, healthy here. You just want to bet three streets, obviously in position, nothing else to do. If he <laughs> raises turn, I would just. 3 bet turn because honestly I think his range will be unbalanced towards value in that spot. Yeah, okay, yeah. Like against some unbalanced I would flat and protect my, just flat my whole range in position against the turn range, but hypothetically there, if he raises on the turn, I would just try and get the money in now because he's probably just got a super yeah. tight range and there are action killing rivers like a 9, a queen. I'm just going to bot it because I've got him tagged as a bad regular. No, it's good and also your range is polar here anyway, like A, he might call a lot because he's bad, sure, and B, like your range is really polarised, like you do have a bunch of bluffs that missed here, so you want to go big with your range because you, yeah. you are going to be bluffing this river a ton if you're playing balance, so maybe you're not yeah. playing balance if you know he overcalls his range, I don't know, but I think it's fine. Yeah, nice, nice hand, really like the way you yeah. played it. Mainly so I was telling you what to do, that's why I like it, but no, you were playing it that way anyway, so that was good job. See this guy, it's got to be a fish, right? Oh no, okay. maybe not. Symmetrical O's and A's. Table 2, Upa. It's got Zendine Zidane. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I see ya. I don't know if Yeah, yeah. possibly. Maybe he's on. I've got a tag for fish, right? So maybe that's what it is. Mm. Maybe it could be one of those. In between, yeah. It's like he's got the football player, but then he's got like the symmetrical name, so it's kind of... We'll see if we can give someone the tag that you were talking about earlier on. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe we should <laughs> maybe we should show the guys what that is, actually, because it's kind of interesting. This one? Shit as fuck. This is an expression <laughs> we use in Scotland when something is really, like... I would just check this flop with King Six yeah. against an aggro, because he's going to bet too much here, and you have the best hand so much. You need to have a... You do need to check fold this flop sometimes, you need to have yeah. this in your... No, call, 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 oh. call, 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 Because remember, he's aggro, he's going to just be betting, like, too wide, yeah. so definitely call. So only 27 hands, but I suppose... Yeah, it doesn't so. matter, like, you should, you will be check folding that flop sometimes, you need to have a check call range, 6x is fine, just, yeah, use that, and then just bet river, yeah. <laughs> you could check, I mean, try and get him to reignite some bluff. I'm having a bit of a hard time just seeing what worse hands he's going to call you with there. Maybe 7x, maybe. Maybe, uh -huh. yeah. maybe it's okay to bet because he does have some 7x there for sure. Or pocket 8s or something. But yeah, so on that flop, you need a check in range because you can't just check full there and nothing else, right? That would be terrible. Yeah. And you can't see bet everything. That would also be terrible. I don't think you yeah. can see bet everything out of position. So you need a check in range. So you need to. You do need to check call some good showdown value hands like that and like two good over cards and the back door draw and stuff like that too so check call is just your play there 
um, and probably is 100%. Yeah, 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 I agree. I think it's dry enough. Um, not happy. That was some of 45 hands. Yeah, just call it in. You're so. perfectly happy to call there. Probably a reg, like the kind of the hot girl avatar, the reason being like, yeah, I'm going to be looking at this all day because I'm playing poker all day, therefore I want something that I like to look at, I guess is the rationale, so probably a reg thing. Checking back is probably, this. Um, I think checking back is okay? No, I would just bet on it. I think I would just bet turn shove river because I just don't think they balance a turn checking ratio with ace king like very often. I think you just, you're losing too much value if you check back turn. Okay. I think check back ace jack because then you can be checking ace jack ace queen, but mm -hmm. I think your hand's too good that you have to okay. bet turn shove river here. Not necessarily that river. I mean, it does complete stuff. I think I'd check back here without knowing that the game was a station. If I knew you overcalled his range here, I would bet, but I think it's too thin otherwise. So I'd check that river, but I would bet. Oh, wow, that proves me wrong. He does go ahead and check all his king on the turn, which is bad. It's just stupid. Yeah. Like, why would you do that? Like, it's the top of your value range almost. You don't really have many better value hands. You have a few, but hardly any. And what that means is if he's checking Ace King there, his turn range is so weighted towards bluffs and semi bluffs, mm -hmm. it's unreal. So yeah, yeah. you can just call turn really wide there. As with bluff catchers, you can overcall your range on the turn for sure against his bets. And you can check back your showdown value much more on a turn. So it's just a really unbalanced play that's already given you like a clear route to exploiting him. You know, you know what to do now. You know how to beat yeah. this guy. He, and there's no yeah. need for him to do that because it's not that he doesn't know. This is why it's bad to make huge adjustments without actually basing them on an exploitative read. He doesn't know that you overfold it. He doesn't know that you overflow the flop and that you're stabbing that turn with loads of air. So why do that with like the top of your range? It just doesn't make sense. Um, I think that's too thin. Was, what, to call? Yeah, uh, I don't think it's... Okay. It's just that he's okay. playing one table. Oh, right, okay, then three bet. Just three bet and isolate him and gain the initiative and see bet. You can three bet there. I uh, don't know if I can call... Yeah, you can, yeah, you can call here. Easily, because you have future fold equity as well. You know, the guy can be bluff raising here. You can pick up fold equity on the turn. He can give up turns. You need to call there. You have to defend 6-7 with a backdoor flush draw there. If you don't, you're just under defending your range massively. He check calls here. I would, I'd expect that, I don't know, like, what is he? I'm actually tempted to, to just jam, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, you're at the bottom of your range. I mean, I don't understand why he check calls a set on the turn or anything like that. I would do it. I mean, you don't have much air here. When you call this flop, you really can't have that much air, and that's why you should yeah. jam river. Because yeah. just let's just play the spot balance. We don't know what he's doing. Um, just play balance, nice hand. I mean, you have one of the few air combos in your range. You have a ton of sets and two pair there that's going to yeah. shove for value. you got to shove that combo, like, definitely. Yeah, well played. Yeah, for sure. Like it could be bad, it could turn out in a vacuum that he was just some fish with ace that was never folding, and that was his whole range, but we don't know that, that's the point, that's why we have to play against, we have to play in a more balanced way. So yeah. We have to bluff 7 high, because 7 high gains an absolute shitload of equity when you turn it into a bluff, Yeah. because it doesn't have showdown value. So shit as fuck, yeah, we say that in Scotland, we'll say that's, that's cool as fuck, or we'll say like, <laughs> shit as fuck, or we'll say like, of loads of things. We say pure, like it's pure shit, it means it's like yeah. really bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we also use the word shite a lot instead of shit, like it's just a variation, I suppose. I don't think anyone else, anywhere else in the world people say that. Say shite, no, not really. Maybe in England they do a bit, but. Maybe. Um, like this guy looks like a fish Nadal 335 sports yeah. name number flag of his country Oops. Romania probably a Romanian fish yeah I would guess this is the guy the fan 83 you were talking about earlier who plays higher or something like that you were saying yeah right? I've, I've seen him at like 50 maybe even 100 before yeah um yeah, but we were talking earlier on about like guys in the higher states who are having to move down. Uh -huh. um, Tough climate. Yeah. It's like winter has come in the poker world and now 50 and L regs are playing 10. Like in five years' time, I'll be like, hey guys, this is characters just playing at 1 NL, you know, because I can't <laughs> beat 3 NL anymore. Yeah. Made um, enough money to buy like a chocolate bar this week, so it's okay. 
This guy's playing two tables, so I don't know. Um, Probably a reg if he's playing two tables. Um, I would. Do you want a checking range here? I don't know. He's in the big blind. I would just see about everything against the big blind range because like he's not gonna have connected that well with this lot. <clears throat> Your range is pretty strong here as well. I don't know. No, maybe I wouldn't see. No, I wouldn't see what everything actually is terrible. But some hands you want to give give up with here, and some hands you want to check back for showdown value. No, you want a checking range here. What am I talking about? You do want a checking range. Yeah, it makes most especially because he called out the big blind. He's yeah. not like to. Um, yeah. Oops. I guess when he calls it the big blind, he can have more suited broadways and suited and like broadways and things like that. They're getting a decent price than if he called it small blind. So he maybe does connect with that board. His range mm -hmm. is a bit less pocket pair heavy when he calls it the big blind. Yeah. So he does actually connect with that board like okay, like reasonably has more tens than if he'd called it a small blind and that kind of thing. So I mean it's probably okay. But then by the same token, he has more air as well, so it's probably not a huge deal. Yeah, and this guy you should just assume is some kind of recreational player. And he shoves 43 bags, it's a good note to take. I'm just going to briefly um, bring up my recorder just so I know roughly how we're doing for time. Sorry for the slight interruption to your viewing, guys. Okay, we're at 40 minutes, so it's going to be a pretty short session today. We'll play another like 5-10 minutes um, just to talk through a few more spots. We'll wrap up for today and we'll actually go into a bit more detail on theory, using some slides and stuff next time, and then doing a bit more play. We'll be doing a lot of live play in this um, series so you guys can get an idea of how we're actually just playing our ranges and approaching this, our in-game thought process. That's really important to work on, is the in-game thought process and not just the out-of-game. So yeah, I think it's a clear open against a fish who could well be fit or fold. And I think you should just see bet this board, yeah. even though it's not great for you, but a small see bet here should work often enough. Always remember your required fold equity in that spot. You're betting 35 <laughs> into 57, you know, it's not gonna need to work very often. You need yeah. to work like 38% or something. So um, nice to flop the double belly buster. I think against this I mean he's going to fold he's yeah, it's under pairs. pairs. Uh -huh. He's yeah. going to be paired. I think this guy, although we were saying earlier on, yeah, you're right. from the big bang, this yeah. guy's going to be pair heavy. Call, um, call. So implied odds call, just a purely chasing call. Like yes, his range is strong when he raises you here, then that's great for you because it means your implied odds are just super there. Yeah, you have a much easier time. Um, yeah, I think you have to fold the turn. Unfortunately, the ace just doesn't help you at all. It's not a card that we're actually bothered about. We don't want to call flop to make a pair of aces. That's not the plan. His range is super strong. He's a net. He raises on the wet board. We're basically looking to make it straight. And when he denies us those odds, we're not really drawing to trips or two pair in the river because it's not going to be good very often. We're more looking to make a polar hand that just crushes his value hands like a straight. I think I need to bet here for value and protection. I think it's a fish, so I think I just would bet here. I would maybe check call this hand if I was against the reg. It yeah. would be one hand that would be in my check call range, but I've got reason to believe this is a fish. Yeah. So it's fifty thirty so far, so looks like one. King ten, the hijack's kind of close. Just look at who's in the blinds. You do have one net in the big blind. Depends how often you're getting three bet by the other players at the table there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That. So this is kind of like what a coaching session might look like if we were doing live play. We do we did a lot of stuff on like your database. We worked a lot in there first, and then we only started doing this towards the end of our sessions, I suppose, like the live yeah. play stuff because we'd already built up the theory. Then we were trying to like actually implement it. Um, we like to three bet here with Ace Queen against someone who's seventeen fifteen. I, I might just flat honestly. I just think there's a fish in the small blind whom you want to play with, and I don't think you're getting that much value by three betting three betting a nitty player here. So I'd probably right, just okay. have a more polar range, to be honest with you. And here, like you've got a couple of options actually. You can you can definitely check this flop because I don't think he's going to fold anything um, better than Ace Queen here. Ever really you might fold Ace King actually. Yeah. Eh. Yeah, we check this flop. Yeah. I mean, you've got like some mm -hmm. value okay. and stuff. If you had a worse Ace X, then you could definitely go ahead and you know bet it. But I, don't, I think this should be in your checking range, so you can have some ace of clubs in your checking range. You know, then you can just call with some showdown value and you know the nut, not, not yeah. flush draw here. You can just call and it's totally fine. 
and then just follow the river because you've got other things in here. You've got like Jack X here you can call the river with, so you don't need to call with Ace X again. Like yeah. the guy's also tight, so we should probably overfold our range there. So I think that's a better way to play the hand than just oh I flopped in a flush draw, I have to bet. Like just get out of that way of thinking. It's too rigid, you know. Like yeah, you don't especially need to bet against there. especially against a player like that who's really tight. Yeah, um, he's gonna have a lot of pairs basically as well in his yeah. range, and you're just never getting faults from them in the flop. So you're putting in money with like decent equity, but when you get raised on the flop, it actually really sucks because you don't get yeah. to use your position. Yeah, you can maybe get it in, and it's like zero EV or something, but it's way worse than if you just end up checking that flop. And yeah, checking is really plus EV. Like it's way more plus EV than betting is there. I would say so. Yeah, good check. The only downside is that Ace King without a club does fold the flop, um, but. You know, he'll well for about that some amount anyway. It's not like he has that all day and we do block it, so I'm not that worried. Squeeze here, yeah. Yeah. You don't really want to play this hand multi way, you can get value. You've got a fish, yeah. Crash Bandicoot. See, when it's Crash Bandicoot in the Avatar, um, I'm more inclined to think it's fishy because that's not like a really geeky game, you know? Yeah. Crash Bandicoot was just a guy that spun into boxes. Oh, oh wow, the men for about this, like, really Yeah, sucks. it's just like ACs every single time, isn't it? Just fold then. Like, just make it super exploited to the fold, I really don't mind. Like, if you think the population just never bluffs in this spot at all, then just don't even bother calling. Yeah, like, just I'm fold. Gonna, I'm not going to, yeah. Because this range is probably something like Kings plus Ace King suited or something ridiculous, yeah. so, yeah. Sure. This one that we should have put in the, um, in the lists we were talking about yeah, earlier. Yeah, four betting, early position. Like the men, yeah. like the men. The, the men, men four betting, yeah. yeah. Especially in those positions, I mean, it's just super racist. Like, it's a terrible way to play the hand as well, because we just made an amazing fold, because we have that read. Like, we don't even know the guy, but we have that read. Um, flop. I think I can call this. Yeah, you can, can call it? Yeah, of course, because you've got future fold equity as well. Like, when he gets up on his bluffs, you've got a really clear bet on a lot of river cards. Um, need to bet this river, because don't bet it too big, though, because like, you do have some ASX. It's just going for thin value here. Um, you don't need to go too big, just make like value looking. I'd go smaller, honestly, like more value sizing. Yeah. 420? Yeah. Because like a lot of your range wants to value bet thin here, like you have some bad two pair, you have some ace x, like it's not like you're super polar in that spot, so you yeah. get smaller. Just balancing our range again, we don't know how often the guy's folding river when he checks, probably quite often, but we don't know for sure, so that's it. And the reason we call turn is nothing to do with the fact that Okay, it's not just because we have like pot odds and implied odds, because that's actually a spot that's not a pure chasing spot. It's not a spot where we're relying solely on making our hand, because we're in position we have future fold equity. Um, I'm going to call here. Yeah, I, I, of... I would call because there's so many fish on the table, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's a future fold equity spot where we can either improve to the nuts on the river, near nuts, or we can end up winning the pot because our opponent checks and gives up. So clear call on the turn, getting three to one for all those good things to happen. It's much more complex than just pods there. Yeah. Implied odds and future full equity thing, but yeah, fantastic. Uh huh. I would normally, if like, if there was more regulars, if like there was a regular that went all in there, I would normally like watch the hand. Yeah, for sure, and get some info. But with a fish, you're less less inclined to give up the volume for it because you're not going to see yeah. him again. Yeah, might still be worth it. I'm not sure. Probably not though. Like volume is money. Do you think it's called here? Three bet. Like again, if you've got the read, you just don't four bet bluff. You hear just three bet fold. Like you can get called by worse. You don't have yeah, to play your hand multi way. Like if they're gonna play that badly and just not be four bet bluffing you, then you can just three bet fold ace king off. Like it's fine. Because they're not gonna four bet like queens or jacks either, probably. So you're not like folding huge equity. You're just um. So are you just going with the read that they don't three bet bluff this position? Yeah, you're just gonna fold yeah, like yeah. most of your range. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I want a Duncan range. Um, what yeah. happened here? We just called out the big blinds. No, probably not. No, I don't think we do. I think this is a board that's a bit too dry. Definitely want to just... I would raise here and bet River, though. I think his range is pretty weak. Like, you've got loads of equity. Um, you could just take the price, but I think you've got enough fold equity on turn and River to just do that. And now you need to bet because you have 7 high. You can have more straws. You can have, like, 9x or whatever. So If he has a king, he has a king. He's not going to fold, but there's not really much we can... We can do for that. Yeah. All right, we're gonna head. We're gonna sit out for now and just sign off, I guess. And next time we're gonna do a bit more theory and things like that. So, yeah, good cool. fun. Did you enjoy the first episode of Grinder School? Yes, yeah, it was really good. Yeah. 
um, yeah, I'm really excited to do the series. So um, yeah, hopefully we can put some good content out of just what times. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Fair cut back to that action then. Yeah. <laughs> um, Gaia Fish. 37.35 kind of aggro, did he dunk? Oh no, he's just sea betting, right? No, no, it's just sea betting. Yeah, you can have a raising range. Well, yeah, you can have a raising range here. Just, it's a wet board, like you're going to have against a guy with these stats, like he looks so active so far, I think I would just exploitatively like raise his flop for value a lot. I think that's fine. Yeah. You don't have much 8x. The thing is, like, normally you wouldn't have a raising range there because you only have four value combos. You have 8s and 7s. Like if you were against mm -hmm. someone decent, but you're not, so you don't need to worry about balance there. You're probably just yeah. against an overly sea betty. Depends. I mean, there's an argument for calling there as well if he's just going to barrel too much. He does look super aggro, so maybe I would delay my whole raising game to the turn there, actually, because he does look pretty aggro. He's going to yeah. barrel you a lot. Set, set, set. It's like, don't sign off. We just flop sets every hand. I know, so play. <laughs> no action with such sets, though, unfortunately. Okay. Right, so we'll be back next time. Um, doing a bit of theory, doing a bit more stuff. If you want to get in touch with me, guys, about private coaching, as Scott did when I first met him, you'll also have the opportunity to feature in these series some at some point down the line. Um, and, yeah, just get in touch with me by PMing me on Grinder School or at admin at carrotcorner.com. Check out my website as well at carrotcorner.com if you want to find out any details. Um, we'll be back next time. Good luck at the tables. And, yeah, looking forward to this series. Fuck computer. <laughs> I take it that's not dead since you're saying stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like I've hit stop and the video's just not appeared anywhere. Uh don't say that. Oh I didn't hit stop. Shit. That's gonna be an editing job for Jeffrey. Jeffrey, please edit this last bit where I swore out of the video. Thank you very much, man. <laughs>